Hi everyone, welcome to week number three in Bio 120 Lab. I hope everything is going well for you. Um, I hope you're getting all your work turned in and maybe if you're having to stay home extra for the next couple of weeks, you'll be able to um, get your work done and get it all turned in on time. If not, please let me know if you're having any struggles or any issues. I'm always here for you. Okay, uh, let us get started. So, last week you learned about <clears throat> organic molecules, carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, nucleic acids. You also learned about the importance of water and pH, which is a matter of, measure of acidity or alkalinity of water solutions, and the importance of buffers, which maintain pH at certain levels, especially in organisms. <clears throat> so you did experiments. You um, looking at pH and also looking at a buffering system to see how that manages um, pH when you add acids or bases to them. And of course, we talked about last week the importance of maintaining pH because when you add hydrogen ions or hydroxide ions to cells, you change their molecules. You change their carbohydrates, lipids, especially the proteins and the nucleic acids, and so they don't work like they're supposed to. So, of course, that's bad. Um, this week, we're going to learn all about cells, and before we even get into cells, we'll learn about diffusion and osmosis. Diffusion is just the principle where molecules move from areas of high concentration to lower concentration until equilibrium is reached, and that makes sense, right? You, you understand that. If somebody squirts a squirt of perfume into a room, the person closest to uh, where it's been squirted <clears throat> will smell the perfume first, but eventually everybody in the room will smell the perfume. Even with no air conditioning going, no fan going, no movement uh, of the bodies in the room, you will smell the perfume. So that's diffusion. Osmosis is the movement of water, the diffusion of water across a membrane. And so that's what um, part of your lab this week concerns, and that's movement of water across dialysis tubing, which acts just like a cell membrane. So you'll learn uh, about osmosis by doing that experiment with a dialysis tubing. <clears throat> also, you're going to learn about different types of cells, prokaryotic cells, which are the bacteria, another word used to um, talk about prokaryotic cells is just the word bacteria. Bacteria is plural. Bacterium is a singular cell, but of course bacteria are found in huge populations, so you're normally saying bacteria. And then eukaryotic cells, like our cells, plant cells, protists, like an amoeba, um, uh, and also the fungi, which includes mushrooms and molds and those types of organisms. So those are all eukaryotic cells. We have very big complex cells compared to bacterial cells. And then you also learn some about viruses and viruses are not cells. Viruses are not living. They're not considered living by microbiologists because they don't have a way to replicate or make copies of themselves. They don't produce any energy, they don't use any food. There's so many things that they don't do. They're just little packets of genetic information. And it, if you can't really wrap your head around that, think about what a computer virus is. A computer virus is just some code that gets into your computer, takes it over, and does what it wants your computer to do. And this is the reason that computer viruses were named that, because they work just like viruses in organisms. So viruses and organisms are just little packets of information that change the way that the cells work. And it, um, they're sort of like pirates, and they take over the, the um, ship, which would be the host cell, and make that ship do what it wants it to do. So that's how viruses work. And you're going to learn about structures in cells and in viruses by making your own.
Okay, um, one thing that I wanted to mention, because this is what the lab is partially about, is hypotonic, isotonic, and hypertonic solutions. All right, isotonic means that you have the same number of water molecules outside the environment. So let's talk about cells. So outside the cell versus inside the cell. That also means that you have the same number of solute molecules inside and outside. So what are solute molecules? They're molecules that are dissolved in the water. That's all that means. So in this example that I have right here, they're using salt as the um, solute that's in the water solution. So in isotonic solutions, you have the same amount of water inside and outside the cell. In a hypertonic solution, which is not what I have a picture of right here, think about it this way. If you say hyper, just think tons and tons of sugar. So if you got lots of sugar in a solution, that means you have very few water molecules, okay? So if you have a hypertonic solution outside of a cell, that means you have very little water outside of the cell. That means you have more water inside the cell. So guess what? The membrane that's between the cell and the solution lets water pass through it. Which way is the water going to move? Because you know the principle of diffusion. The water is going to move from inside the cell to outside the cell in that hypertonic solution with lots and lots of sugar, salt molecules, whatever's out there. Um, so the water is going to move outside of the cells. Now hypotonic solution outside of the cell is the opposite. Hypotonic means there's lots of water and very, very few sugar molecules. Think about it that way compared to the inside. So which way is the water going to move? There's more water outside than inside. It's going to move into the cell. Okay, so that gives you an idea of how these terms work. I also have a little video here that you can look at um, where the experimenter is putting molasses into dialysis tubing so that you see what's supposed to happen. Now, of course, you realize with molasses, molasses has lots and lots of sugar molecules in it. And so that also means that there are very few water molecules in molasses. So if you have lots of water outside the tubing and molasses inside, the water should move into the tubing. So you take a look at the video and see if that is the case. All right, since you're also learning about viruses this week, I thought that I would bring up COVID-19 and the coronavirus that's causing um, this huge outbreak across the world right now. It's not massive, but it's in so many countries now. So COVID-19 stands for Corona Virus Disease 19, and 19 stands for 2019. So uh, I wanted to talk about this just for a little bit. Um, everyone should not be scared. There is a reason that people should uh, stay at home if they possibly can and not be in big crowds because we don't want this disease to spread throughout the population. Hospitals absolutely cannot handle thousands and thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of cases of this disease. There just is no way for that to happen. So we'd all be sick at home with no treatment, um, most likely, whatsoever. No supportive care. That's really the most important thing. So let's talk about it for just a second. This is a coronavirus, which is similar to the SARS virus, um, where we had an outbreak of uh, this a few years ago, where the whole city of Toronto, Canada was quarantined. I mean, literally shut down. You couldn't get in or out of the city. Um, but there were cases of it around the world. Um, it's also similar to a camel um, spread virus that was found in the Middle East, the MERS virus. Uh, but we have decided to call it SARS-CoV-2, which stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. That's the SARS Coronavirus 2. So that's what it's been named now, and it causes the disease COVID-19. Some important things about this virus is that it, number one, is an enveloped virus, and that is really good news. 
because that means that those hand sanitizers that everybody's been talking about really will work against this virus, just like those hand, hand sanitizers work against the flu virus because it's enveloped. The alcohol in the hand sanitizer disrupts that envelope, which is lipid-based, it's fat-based, and that alcohol disrupts that envelope <clears throat> and helps to make it inactive. So that is really good news that it's an enveloped virus. It also responds very well to washing your hands with soap and water, uh, which of course everybody's been talking about. It's an RNA virus, it's non-segmented, meaning it only has one long piece of RNA, <clears throat> and it is positive, a positive strand of RNA, which means as soon as it gets into your cells, it can start making the viral proteins that it needs. It doesn't have to wait around and do some extra steps. Um, you'll notice on the picture that I have here that it has a bunch of nice red spikes on it, the S protein. And the S protein, S stands for spike. Um, those spikes, as you can imagine, help the virus to get into your cells. It sticks to your cells and causes that cell to grab the virus and bring it in. It sort of tricks the host cell into thinking that it's something that it really wants and it brings it into the cell and now you're infected. Um, we don't have a vaccine yet. We don't have good treatments for it yet. We just have to use um, supportive care if someone's really sick and that means if someone is really sick they need to go to the hospital. It's mostly affecting the elderly and people have, who have underlying health conditions like asthma and diabetes and heart problems and respiratory problems and cancer and all sorts of other diseases. Um, I will give you a link to the CDC website. That's the best place to get information. I know you're getting it from every direction right now, which is pretty disturbing. Uh, there's lots of misinformation out there. So please go to the Centers for Disease Control website and get the most accurate information that there is. So I did want to bring that up. And if you have any questions about it, please let me know. Even if I don't know the specific answer to something very technical about um, the virus, I can certainly look it up, read it, and interpret it for you. So please let me know if you have any questions about this. All right, on to stuff for this week. <clears throat> okay, lab this week. Lab this week has dialysis tubing experiment that you need to do. And that dialysis tubing is a little bit tricky to work with. I hope you can get the clips to work better than I did because they were very difficult for my little fingers to mash together, but maybe you can do better than me. So I tied knots. Um, dialysis tubing, the potato experiment <clears throat> with iodine. Please, 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 I have it in the uh, comments right here where your safety gear for all of these experiments as especially with the iodine experiment um, because that is strong iodine solution. It'll get all over you for one thing and it's pretty corrosive to materials uh, and you don't want to get it on you so you use your safety gear. So you got the potato experiment also where you're putting um, different sized chunks of potato into iodine solutions and the starch in the potato reacts with iodine and turns blue-black color. So you're looking from uh, at these potato chunks from bigger chunks to smaller chunks to see how much of that iodine is absorbed into these pieces of potato and then you're doing some calculations. And then you're also doing some work um, producing a bacterial cell, a eukaryotic cell of some type, and also a virus um, using some keys and some information that's in the lab and you'll be drawing these out. You will be making drawings and you have colored pencils included to help you with that. Um, and then you're going to figure out what this type of cell or virus is using a key. So I'll touch on that in just a second. So the reason that I'm giving you an overview of these three labs is because you need to understand that it is going to take you some amount of time to do this work. Because even after you take the measurements, there are quite a few calculations that you have to do. And then you have to use the keys 
to figure out which um, organisms you've produced or viruses. So realize that it is going to take you a little while this week. Um, extra items that you do need, you need a potato of a, um, I wouldn't say a big potato, but at least a nice medium sized potato for the potato experiment. You need some extra paper to make your drawings on. You need a calculator, that's for sure this week, because there's lots of calculations. And a timer of some type, you know, a lot of us have phones, most of us have phones. Uh, wait a minute, everybody has a phone, uh, which has a timer on it. So, you know, you got a timer. But uh, if I was working around the iodine, I would not use my phone. I didn't. I used a kitchen timer. Um, Wear your safety gear, like I explained. Use your gloves, use your eyewear, your um, safety goggles, your apron. You don't want to get especially that iodine on you. The red food color, and I mean, that's not a real big deal, but the iodine you do not want on you. Um, during the min middle of the potato experiment and the dialysis experiment, you have about an hour's downtime. So realize that you could go and start drawing your cells during that time if you want to set aside like three hours of time to do your lab. So just so you know, you have about an hour downtime while you're waiting on the potatoes and the dialysis tubing where you could do something else. Um, on page 24, the last column where you're entering information, where you're entering words, hypotonic, hypertonic, isotonic. That column means, is the solution in the tube hypertonic, isotonic, hypotonic to the solution outside of the tube? You might want to add that wording to help in your understanding, okay? Because you're talking about the solution in the tube compared to what's outside of the tube. All right, you're also going to be using dichotomous keys. We use these all the time in biology to help us identify organisms because somebody's already figured out ways to, to look at characteristics of organisms or even viruses and help somebody else to identify them. So that's why we have these keys. Dichotomous means two. So you normally have two choices. Is this a DNA virus or an RNA virus? Okay, two choices. That's it. And so you pick which one it is. Now, in your dichotomous keys down toward the end, sometimes there are three choices. And that's not normally the case because, look at the word again, dichotomous key. You're supposed to have two choices. But that's okay because they tried to um, speed up your process a little bit with three choices. So realize how a key goes that you got two choices and you got to pick one and then you follow the instructions. So if you got a DNA virus, okay, then you may go to step number two and see whether it's a double-stranded DNA virus or a single-stranded. So double-stranded versus single-stranded. Pick one, then follow the instructions. Go to the next step. They're not hard to use, I promise. All right, and then for next week, so that was this week. Um, then for next week, here's something that you need to know. You're working with germinated peas, okay, um, to do a respiration lab. And the trick to this experiment next week is that you have to have this started by Thursday in order to finish by Sunday night, okay? This is really important. You have to have the experiment started by Thursday. If you wait until Sunday night, that is too late. You cannot germinate peas in 30 minutes. It takes days, and you have to do this experiment over days. You can't do it all in one day. So read it ahead of time. You're going to soak your peas one day, get them out the next day. So follow the instructions. It's going to take you several days to do this small steps along the way, but you still have to do it ahead of time. <laughs> uh, these are organisms. These peas are, are plants. So, you know, you have to work on their time schedule, not always on yours. So make sure you get this started by Thursday in order to get it finished. 
And the other thing, you're going to need plenty of non-chlorinated water or else you're going to kill your peas. So most water that comes out of a tap has chlorine in it. You can use bottled water. You can use distilled water. Uh, you may have a filter on your sink that filters out chlorine. Okay, all of that is good. All that is awesome. But say you just have ordinary tap water, and we know how the water supply is right now, don't we? Uh, yeah, there's no water anywhere. So good luck at finding some bottled water and having enough to do an experiment like this. So here's my suggestion. <clears throat> Get you a big container, a big bowl, um, empty gallon-sized jug, you know, something, some kind of big container, bucket, whatever, and fill it full of your tap water. And let it sit for several days. If you stir it a couple of times during that couple of days, that'd be awesome. If you don't, that's all right. The chlorine will evaporate from it. But you're going to need a good amount of water. So, bucket, gallon-sized jug, something like that, and let that tap water sit. And the chlorine will evaporate and dissipate. It's like a gas, so it'll come out of the water and then you won't kill your peas. So I just wanted to tell you that ahead of time too because you're going to need that water to even start your experiment. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Then we have the final project. Milestone one is due next week. I've been telling you about this since week one, so I've been wanting you to look at that Ask a Biologist website so that you can choose an experiment. Remember that there are four that are listed, four that are good ones, um, under this milestone number one from that Ask a Biologist website. You may choose a different one. You may choose your own. If you choose a different one from the website or you have an idea for your own, you have to get these okayed by me. And they have to be okayed before you start writing all this up. What's the point of you going and looking up a whole bunch of background information if I'm going to say, you know, that's really not doable. There's no way that you can get that done in the number of weeks that we have. And so then you're going to have to start over again. So you have to get this okayed by me if you don't use one of the four that are listed in that milestone one for the final project. <clears throat> so go to the website, look at those four experiments if you haven't done so already and figure out a research question that you can come up with having to do with that experiment, just like you did with the pH. And everybody did a really good job with that. You change the, the acidity of the solution, you change the amount of solution, you change the type of container, you know, so you're going to figure out your own research question. And then you're going to look up a bunch of background information about this particular experiment and a couple of things to ask yourself when you're looking up information. Why, in the grand scheme of things, is this idea important? And if you look at that first experiment and you see that they use a paper clip to touch parts of your body to see how many points you can detect, you are going to think, what in the world, why would that be important? important. Why would it be important for me to know if I feel two pricks or one prick when I touch a paper clip to my skin? You're going to have to think about it. Why is this important? And then that will give you an idea of what kinds of information to look up. And also, what is known about this phenomenon? Um, what do you know? What is the background information about this particular idea, this particular process that happens uh, for that first experiment? Pain receptors. You know, what's known about pain receptors and how many are in the body and that, and that sort of thing. So look up background information. And you're going to write all this up in your Milestone 1, which will also be due this week. So you've got a lot going on this week for week number three, and just remember that week number four, you're going to have to get it started early, and it's one of the longest labs. Week four is one of the longest labs, so you need to know that ahead of time so that you can budget your time. 
And as always, if you need anything, if you have any issues, if you have any questions about your, what you're doing, please let me know. I'm here for you. I'm here to help you. And I will be glad to answer any questions that you have. Just email me, m.sigmon, S-I-G-M-O-N, at snhu.edu, and I am here for you. And if I don't hear from you, I'll see you through your grading. I'll contact you through email, whatever, and um, have a good week.